I really would like to take this opportunity at the very outset uh, to thank Mr. Kim Solomon for inviting me back uh, yet again to speak at the USLS. It's a tremendous, uh, tremendous honor and privilege. And uh, Mr. K because of somewhat the uh, controversial nature of the work that I do, the last place that uh, <clears throat> that we, the location that I participated in was Hanoi, Vietnam. And uh, a few years before the, the USLS uh, event, it so happened that uh, a group of uh, activists assisted nine North Korean refugees uh, to enter the Danish embassy in Hanoi. And uh, to some degree, the authorities were not entirely amused at this particular uh, project that we had, although I'm happy to say that the nine refugees all were accepted safely eventually and uh, came for resettlement to South Korea. They were not sent back to North Korea. So in that respect, it was very much of a successful venture, I'm happy to say. But <clears throat> Mr. Kim did not let me know that during my speech there were two secret policemen that were sitting in the front row listening to every word. So that is a <clears throat> kind of an interesting uh, little piece of information that I just discovered uh, two years later. But in any case, the name of my little talk is simply called Crossing Borders. And as you might expect, it has something to do with the, uh, the project what I call asymmetric humanitarian initiative. That means we're not operating under conventional rules or conventional um, environment in any way. And uh, perhaps as we go along, I can uh, explain a little bit more uh, why I refer to uh, helping the North Korean refugees as an asymmetric uh, operation. And uh, so it so happens that this is the 22nd year. Uh, time flies quickly when you're having fun, as you know. And uh, it's a little hard for me to believe that uh, more than two decades have elapsed. But I wish I could say that the situation for the North Koreans, both inside their country and the refugees, has improved dramatically. But uh, as we stand here today, uh, I would say that uh, st we're still facing an extraordinarily challenging uh, situation. Nevertheless, there are bright spots and rays of hope that keep uh, streaming through, and I hope you might see some of these as, as we uh, go forward. A very noted uh, Australian-Russian uh, scholar by the name of uh, Dr. Andrei Lenkov uh, perhaps you may have read some of uh, Dr. Lenkov's uh, commentaries and uh, longer reports about North Korea. He made a very insightful comment one time saying that when people talk about the so-called North Korean problem, they're almost always talking about either one of two things. And of course, we all watch CNN news and, and other cable news, and we know that those two issues are either the nuclear program or the uh, intercontinental missile program. I would vehemently disagree with that characterization as that's the main North Korean problem. In my opinion, the denial of human rights for the 23 or so million North Koreans, uh, that is the North Korean problem. Uh, not to say that the other difficulties don't exist and the other challenges, uh, but uh, in my view, the, the extraordinary vacuum of human rights inside North Korea uh, is something that uh, we should all be concerned about. Please don't mistake privileges for rights. There is a certain class within North Korea that have privileges uh, based on their loyalty to a particular leader class. 
but in terms of actual rights uh, as defined by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I think uh, many would agree that uh, these rights are largely absent. One of my heroes is a, an Australian uh, justice by the name of Mr. Michael Kirby. And I hope many of you have uh, heard of Mr. Kirby. He is an extremely brave individual. Um, Michael Kirby was the chairman of the Commission of Inquiry formed by the United Nations in 2014 to explore and investigate the human rights violation environment of North Korea. Mr. Kirby gathered one of the most outstanding blue ribbon commissions uh, in my memory in order to uh, gain as much information factual largely from the 30 plus thousand North Korean defectors who have made their way mainly to South Korea but to other countries as well, Japan, the US and a smattering of other countries as well. This particular commission was formed under the auspices of the United Nations Human Rights Council. And it was an extraordinary uh, finding. And I think one of the most extraordinary things about it was Mr. Kirby's comments that, and I've quoted him uh, in the PowerPoint, we dare say that the case of human rights violations in the DPRK exceeds all others in duration, intensity, and horror. Please keep in mind that Justice Kirby was not one of the red-faced activists that was storming some embassy, but he was a very sober and highly respected former judge in Australia, and when he made these statements, many eye eyebrows were raised that the, the particular language that Justice Kirby chose to describe the situation inside uh, the DPRK. And he even uh, went a step further and described it to uh, Nazi uh, Germany in terms of intensity, summary executions, prison system, etc. So I would urge you, if you have a, an abiding interest in North Korea, please go to the, uh, to the uh, United Nations Human Rights Council website and uh, you can freely download the, uh, the entire report, which was finished in 2014 uh, the Commission of Inquiry Report on Human Rights uh, Inside North Korea. Now that's about 350 pages long. If you want a slightly shorter uh, summary of that, uh, please contact me after if you are able to. I have been given permission the day before I left Seoul, Korea to distribute freely a excellent report called the Evaluation Report of the North Korean Human Rights Situation after the 2014 UN Commission of Inquiry Report. It's uh, beautifully um, summarized and uh, graphically presented. I have it in PDF format. Please feel free to ask me if you have a uh, USB stick, etc. I will gladly download it from the laptop and give it to you. I think you'll find uh, it is uh, quite excellent. A few pages of it will be included in my presentation. One of the deepest concerns, and probably you are aware of this, is the violation of the right to food inside North Korea. Uh, this particular photograph was taken by a French journalist, and he never explained to me how he got it. Uh, this is not normal for a Western journalist to have access to uh, this particular location, but it's basically showing a DPRK, North Korean naval vessel, uh, 
most likely on a river, but it is stacked with uh, Red Cross rice. Uh, I think we can all guess fairly accurately that the ship is not headed for the local orphanage, but it is heading towards an, a naval base or some other military location. So this is, of course, one of the deep concerns that uh, the international community has and explains to a large degree why there is a great deal of what I call donor fatigue with North Korea because so often uh, humanitarian goods are distributed along loyalty uh, lines as opposed to vulnerability, which is of course the accepted, the accepted uh, uh, way to distribute goods. Well, this is one of the pages, by the way, from the excellent book from the North Korea Database Center. I forgot to give the, the source of this book. So this is just one of the pages. Hopefully it might whet your appetite to uh, get the whole thing. As, it, as you will note here, uh, in, figures indicate that in the year 1995, roughly 500,000 people died from uh, famine conditions and starvation inside North Korea. And then in 1996 and 1997, roughly one million. Uh, these are grim statistics. They've improved somewhat, but I think it's important to mention that the improvements are in specific pockets of the DPRK as opposed to uh, across the board. And as you might imagine, the pockets have much to do with who's living there, their loyalty, and where they stand in the, the totem pole of South, uh, North Korean society. Another very grim aspect to North Korea is the archipelago of prison camps that exist there. Um, most likely, I mean, 10 years ago, very few people had heard about the severity of the prison camps. Uh, I think the media and other agencies have, have done a fairly good job of now kind of uh, presenting more material about this. But uh, one of the inherent uh, problems inside the prison system, among many other, uh, include the violation of the right to life. That includes summary executions, uh, freedom of expression and belief, uh, a, a larger number of the uh, inmates of, of this archipelago of prison systems uh, are uh, religious believers, uh, the great majority being Christians, and uh, altogether the estimate at the moment is roughly somewhere of between 80 and 130,000 prisoners uh, throughout North Korea who are in what are called the prison camps. Uh, not just local jails, but these are uh, long-term uh, and in some case maximum security uh, prison uh, locations where oftentimes entire families uh, are uh, incarcerated. Uh, this is another page from the NKDB's book. I won't go into the details, but uh, you can see there. So this is uh, another good example of their excellent summary of some of the findings uh, of the uh, COI, Commission of Inquiry report. Torture and other types of inhumane treatment are uh, characteristic of prison life inside North Korea. Uh, I have, this, these two particular drawings were done as described by North Korean inmates to an artist. I can't remember if the artist himself was a North Korean, but as you can see here, uh, one of the pictures is showing someone to being whipped as, as he's tied up to the prison bars. And in the second picture, you can see that a very, very thin prisoner is uh, grabbing a rodent, a rat, 
and uh, that will be a source of protein for him because of the extremely limited daily ration that exists in there. So I do realize a lot of this is fairly grim. Um, there aren't too many laugh lines in my, uh, in my presentation today, but I hope you'll bear with me because this is, uh, this is uh, a, uh, a, a grim subject. Um, the reason, I, I guess I wanted to preface the Underground Railroad with the conditions inside certain aspects of North Korean society so that you would hopefully understand that because of the lack of expression inside North Korea, oftentimes the only way an individual would be able to express his individuality or even a sense of rebellion against a, kind, a totalitarian environment is to what I call vote with their feet. And vote with their feet in this uh, context would mean uh, without the permission of the regime to cross over into a second country. And uh, millions of North Koreans have done so uh, in the last 15 years. And uh, many of them are still hiding in South Korea or the Korean Peninsula's largest neighbor, uh, but some have made their way uh, down to other nations, I mean, to Mongolia, uh, some into Russia, and as you may be aware, uh, a rather large number have made their way down into Southeast Asia, uh, including Laos, including Vietnam, including, including Myanmar, a small number, but many are accepted or make their way all the way to Thailand, and uh, which is uh, a rather remarkable and uh, extremely difficult and dangerous journey from the North Korean-China border. Uh, so before actually getting into what we call the Underground Railroad of helping uh, people who have left their homeland uh, voluntarily and are seeking uh, freedom and choices of, for their own family, I thought it might be interesting for you to see and maybe inspire you to become more involved in voting with your feet, uh, raising your voices uh, in defense and protection of North, Korean, North Koreans. Now these pictures were taken over a period of time. A group of us were uh, traveling to Europe uh, at, in the year 2008 in order to raise the issue of forced repatriation uh, from the People's Republic of China of North Korean refugees uh, being, being sent back to certain punishment. Uh, we, a group of about 65 of us, uh, appeared uh, at the UN building in Geneva. You can see the picture here. I'll go through these fairly quickly. Uh, on another occasion, we went to the British Parliament and uh, other key locations in London in order to raise our voices and make contact with individual members of parliament, et cetera, to raise this issue. Um, I believe this is in Belgium, in Brussels, yes. And uh, it was exciting to have a large number of young people, some traveling with us and some uh, were joining us as we were traveling throughout Europe uh, in the early summer of 2008. Uh, this happened to be in Germany, uh, standing outside one of the relevant embassies, uh, all of us calling for a halt to the illegal resending of North Koreans back to their country and uh, uh, hazardous for them. By the way, uh, just to indicate the fear that some North Koreans have of being caught and sent back to North Korea in neighboring countries, some of them, 
will actually carry a small vial of poison with them and uh, to ingest in the event that they are captured by the local authorities and sent to a detention center in preparation for them to be re repatriated. You will see a, a picture later in one of the slides where two ladies were successfully assisted out of, out of uh, a neighboring country next to North Korea, but one of the ladies has a bandage over her wrist because uh, she attempted uh, with a razor blade to end her life as opposed to uh, be, being sent back uh, to North Korea. Uh, this is not uh, to be overly dramatic. It's simply uh, to express the severity and the soberness of uh, the challenges and dangers being faced by North Koreans who have escaped uh, the, their own uh, nation. Uh, the Dutch were particularly responsive, and uh, this picture indicates uh, all we had to do was make a suggestion, and uh, suddenly uh, new, uh, new banners were made, and uh, people seemed to come out of the woodwork in order to uh, join us in, in front of an embassy uh, calling for the, the end of uh, this policy, which is frankly illegal under international conventions, that of repatriation. Uh, this is a German friend, uh, very outstanding uh, voice. Uh, we were at the Dutch parliament and calling, uh, obviously outside the parliament, but calling on parliamentarians to uh, act in their own capacity to try to uh, bring this practice to a halt. Uh, again, that this was when we traveled to Sweden, and this was the head, uh, I'm t on the left, and then the gentleman on the right is the head of a noted uh, Norwegian NGO uh, in terms of uh, protecting uh, human rights. And uh, much to our surprise, as we were holding the banners up, uh, a delegation of, of related diplomats related to this issue and related to the country that we were uh, discussing uh, happened to come around the corner. So one never knows where their voice will be heard and uh, how much impact it may have. This is uh, in the Brandenburg Gate. And I took, uh, I took a try at the Speaker's Corner in London and uh, even brought up the subject there, and uh, I was uh, uh, challenged uh, uh, quite uh, openly and uh, vigorously by a number of individuals, but I found that it was a very interesting and, uh, yeah, difficult, uh, but I'm glad, I'm glad I tried it. We had an interesting experience in France, in, in uh, Paris, uh, you can see us there. The national police are in front of us. We were attempting to go uh, to make a demonstration, and uh, we were stopped, actually. The French police uh, physically detained us and uh, told us that we could not go to a particular embassy to make that, uh, to make that objection, uh, which rather surprised us, but uh, nevertheless, uh, we gave it uh, we gave it everything we had. That was in New York. This is in Washington, D.C. Uh, one of the North Korean refugees who resettled in the United States is seen in the picture, and she was on a hunger strike, and she uh, finally weakened, and she's shown here in a hospital, but she eventually, uh, she eventually uh, recovered and, and joined us again. So, these are just, and these are pictures of similar demonstrations in Seoul, Korea uh, that take place uh, from time to time. But this, at this particular year, it was done on a daily basis. It was called the 444 campaign. So uh, does it work? Does this kind of adv advocacy work? Well, there's a picture here of a wonderful friend of mine, a North Korean 
a newly resettled South Korean now by the name of Yoo Sang Jun, and uh, an extraordinarily brave man. He's standing uh, third to the right in this picture, very bravely going into China to help North Koreans and uh, help children, help human traffic victims. And uh, on two occasions, he was caught and put in detention uh, in the People's Republic of China. And fortunately, the activist community was able to galvanize around the issue and use every possible opportunity to, uh, to uh, call on international agencies, to call on the United Nations, to call on uh, governments that enshrined freedom and human rights in their constitutions, etc. And I'm happy to say that in this case, uh, he was freed rather quickly. He himself was convinced that he was going to be sent back to North Korea, even though he was carrying a South Korean passport. He felt that that was an, almost a certainty that he would uh, be sent back, which uh, was rather baffling to me, but I guess it showed the reality uh, to the mind of a individual who grew up in North Korea. So he thought he, that the Chinese would send him. Um, so let's, in a way, be realistic. There are cases where advocacy, reports, conferences, and uh, diplomatic initiatives can make a real difference. There are, have been cases where North Koreans that were awaiting repatriation, uh, there were other interventions that uh, were effective. And uh, I realize that I'm standing in the UN building and, uh, and I want to say with uh, greatest respect and uh, that the Human Rights Council report of 2014 that I've already referenced, I think is one of the most important pioneering works that the UN has done in relation to North Korea. But I have to also say that um, I wish that the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees had been more active in undertaking a brave and clear-cut intervention on behalf of the North Korean refugees. Um, it is uh, not something that I take any joy in, in saying, but it is a difficulty that has existed for quite some time here in uh, East Asia. And uh, the, the UNHCR staff was told a number of years ago that they were not to go up to the Sino-North Korean border to interview refugees or people who were border crossers and were um, in order to determine, which is the mandate of the UNHCR, is to determine who's a refugee and who's not. But the authorities in Beijing simply told them they could not go. And they relented. They did not press the issue and maintained their office and continue to maintain their office in Beijing. So. I'm sure they have their own rationale. Uh, but I must admit, I was somewhat disappointed yesterday when the, the otherwise excellent presentation by the, the UNHCR representative here uh, did not even mention the North Korean crisis uh, in the list of difficulties and problems and challenges that are facing uh, the UNHCR here. Obviously, the Rohingya uh, crisis is one of great seriousness and importance and, uh, and certainly deserves uh, that 
attention. And I do believe that the UNHCR is doing very good work there, and I want to give them every bit of credit for it. But, uh, but I must say that the situation with the North Korean refugees remains frozen, uh, actually, for virtually the last 15 to 17 years. Um, so, uh, that being said, hopefully, uh, hope springs eternal. And I hope that perhaps uh, going forward that maybe something more proactive could happen. I had a little video clip that uh, I was hoping to play at this point, uh, which was made uh, quite a number of years ago, and in a way was a little bit ironic for me. Uh, unfortunately, the video is not working, uh, was not able to uh, um, go well with the system here. So, um, but it actually shows me dropping off a North Korean refugee in front of this building uh, about seven or eight years ago. And uh, unfortunately, he, he was uh, not accepted. But that's, an, that's another story. So in a way, it is most interesting for me to be back at the United Nations building here and uh, speaking from the inside as opposed to trying to bring a North Korean refugee uh, through the front gate. But uh, I would like to just point and bring your attention to the international dimensions of what's called the Underground Railroad of helping North Korean refugees. Now, the Underground Railroad is a reference or uh, some uh, uh, scholars or other pundits have coined the phrase Underground Railroad of, the Nor of Northeast Asia in recollection of the abolition movement in the United States in the 1850s and the 1860s in which uh, American uh, slaves were aided to travel from the slave states in the South to the uh, free states in the North. So I don't know exactly who coined that phrase and applied it to the small group of activists who are helping the North Koreans, but in many ways I think it is quite, uh, it is quite apt. And essentially it has been operating for about 20 years and uh, it assists North Koreans who have crossed the border from their own nation only to find that that is not completely free wherever they may be, whether that be Russia or whether that be the People's Republic of China or uh, Vietnam, for example, and uh, some other, uh, even Laos is, is a little difficult. Um, so this requires logistical assistance uh, in order to help them make it to safe third countries. The irony, of course, is the distance between North Korea and South Korea is about two kilometers at the 38th parallel, if you stop and think about it. But in order for the North Koreans to make it to safety, they often have to undertake this epic exodus that covers many, many, many hundreds of kilometers, in thousands, in, in fact, in order to make it all the way to not only a second country, but a third country as well. So here we have uh, what I call the, an unwelcome sign that uh, faces uh, many North Koreans when they cross either the Tumen River or the Yalu River. Uh, Korean word is Amnokgang, Amnok River, uh, when they have decided to risk their lives to leave. They obviously, in many cases, don't feel free to be identified as North Korean, and in some extreme cases have even uh, dug uh, holes and uh, little uh, burrows uh, on mountainsides in order to at least hide temporarily and to subsist until something uh, more uh, definite or comfortable can be worked out. This is not to say in every case, but in some cases this is what has occurred. 
This is taken from a Time Magazine article a number of years ago that uh, asked to come along on one of our uh, assistance journeys, and it's called uh, Soul Train. And uh, you can see on the map a, uh, obviously the, the arrows indicate what I described earlier, this uh, extremely long journey for a North Korean who leaves his homeland or her homeland in order to, uh, in order to try to find uh, some freedom and ch choice for their family. One of the real tragedies, and there, there are many facets of the, this tragedy, is that roughly 70% of the North Korean escapees are women. And uh, this is particularly serious because um, human trafficking, as we heard about uh, very eloquently yesterday by the IOM uh, agency at particularly, human trafficking is uh, very rampant once the North Koreans leave their homeland. And keeping in mind that the North Korean have no documents, they're not carrying passports, they're essentially branded as illegal economic migrants uh, in their closest neighbor. And therefore, women in particular are prone to being uh, targets and vulnerable to human trafficking of, uh, of many aspects. Uh, the particular woman in the picture here at the time when we visited her was 25 years old. She had been sold once by traffickers to a Korean Chinese man uh, near the Chinese border with North Korea. And she, uh, but the man, the family that bought her as a wife or a kind of mail order bride, if we want to use that term, uh, the man decided he would go to South Korea to get a higher paying job, so his parents were not happy to have her in the home, and they resold her to a second man. Now, this was all taking place by the time she was 25. And uh, she's holding her second child by the, uh, by the second uh, man who purchased her, and she knew that at any time a neighbor could report her to the authorities and they would send her back to North Korea. She would not take her children with her because the parents, the father of the children, uh, is not a North Korean and therefore the child stays with the father. So she would not only have the trauma of going back to North Korea, uh, and, and the punishment that would await her, but also the added trauma of being separated from her children. Uh, this is the, these are the two ladies that I referred to earlier. This was a number of years ago, and I'm uh, showing the picture because if you'll notice the lady on the right, or on my left, uh, looking this way, I mean, she has a bandage on her wrist, and that is from her attempt to uh, take her own life when she was facing imminent repatriation uh, to North Korea. So fortunately, uh, during her prison time in China, uh, somehow she was able to be released, and then it was possible for activists to spirit her out of uh, China, and so that uh, that was uh, a very close call for her, but she was still showing uh, the wound from her attempt at taking her own life. Here's one of the bright spots of, uh, of the um, people who have made it through. This particular young lady uh, was 14 at the time. Her father had come out first, out of North Korea, uh, as is very often the case, the refugees or escapees come in contact with people who are trying to help them, 
as it so happened, uh, the ones that were helping her father were uh, Christians. He, uh, in fact, became a Christian and became so uh, uh, committed and he wanted to, to bring some uh, Christian literature back to his own country. I, I'm not familiar with the exact situation and operation and who was involved, but it is not uncommon for this to happen but apparently he felt passionate about doing it. Um, very tragically, he was caught in going back in and uh, he was summarily ex executed. And uh, in anticipating this possible outcome, he had brought his daughter out and had her out of North Korea and had her stay with a, a clergyman in the Korean Chinese area of, of China on the border. And, uh, but soon the activist community learned that the secret police of North Korea were coming into China to look for her and bring her back into, uh, bring her back into North Korea. So they urgently asked for assistance to evacuate her. And I'm happy to say that it was possible to evacuate her and uh, have her uh, taken uh, to Southeast Asia and she's now living in, in the United States. So uh, that was a rather dramatic uh, circumstance that does not always happen, but it happened in this case. and. Uh, this little boy uh, is named Yu Chul Min. At the time, he was 10 years old, 2001. And actually, his father was the one that the activist community, in an earlier slide, we were advocating for his release from a Chinese prison, which was about 10 years after this took place. In any case, what happened is the father and the son had come out to China. They came in contact with aid workers. Uh, I think the father, I don't know all the details because I wasn't directly involved, but the father uh, felt that he would not want to um, subject his son to the risks of uh, crossing all the way the vast expanse of China together with him in case he got caught and then sent back. So the father decided that he would go first and then when he found a safe way to bring his son. Anyway, it was arranged that the boy, uh, after the father made it safely, uh, some Korean uh, missionaries arranged that he would travel with a number of other North Korean adults and move into Mongolia. Uh, sadly, I mean, I briefly met him for about 30 minutes in China, very briefly, and uh, had a little chat, and it was uh, just, uh, I thought to myself, when he comes to South Korea, it would be nice to introduce my six-year-old grandson to him, and uh, perhaps they could be friends, etc. But all of this was pure speculation, but he was wearing a little baseball cap and he just looked like a normal t uh, little 10-year-old who would think about 10-year-old topics and, and um, activities. Tragically, uh, the arrangement that was made by the missionaries, uh, the main person who knew how to navigate the Gobi Desert was captured by the authorities just before crossing into the Mongolian desert. And the group of North Koreans uh, were longer on the edge of the desert than uh, they anticipated and before they were met by guards. And uh, uh, tragically, the, this 10-year-old boy uh, most likely weakened from within because of years of famine conditions inside North Korea uh, perished in the, uh, perished in the desert. And uh, it was uh, because I had met him for 30 minutes and uh, ever as short as that was, but still 
he made an impact on me and uh, I thought in, in some ways that galvanized a determination in me to help uh, folks that were as vulnerable as uh, so many that he represented. So uh, this is the father who went to Mongolia after that to mourn his uh, son's passing. That's in the right hand picture. Well, I have referenced a number of situations uh, in the past, and you may wonder, well, what about now? What about at the present time? I've talked about 2002, 2008, but this is an ongoing thing, so I thought it might be interesting for you to hear that the night before I left for Bangkok, we got a distress call from six uh, North Koreans that were uh, in distress and uh, hiding in China. And I will, I, I thought about putting pictures up, but I've, I never do that when an operation, a rescue operation is underway. So I will just very briefly describe the situation of these individuals, very briefly, if I may, and just condense it. The first one is a mother who's 40 years old and her son is uh, 13. She said, my husband died of liver cancer. This would be her North Korean husband. I had no choice but to defect with my son to survive. That's why I I crossed the river into China in January of 2017 and worked as a maid for a Chinese family. But the Chinese for whom I worked was assigned to another place in June of this year and we had to leave that house. Uh, now we are, are unprotected and she and her son uh, asked for help. Uh, the mother and son are in the group of six that are now moving across uh, the landscape. And uh, as of uh, about four o'clock this morning, they had uh, made uh, progress uh, roughly half the way to, uh, to their uh, final destination. There's another woman here who is, uh, she said, I have been living in a market begging for small change in North Korea after my husband died of tuberculosis 15 years ago. Uh, I met with a merchant in the market and came to China along with the merchant uh, man as he was old, excuse me, in 2013. I was sold to an old Chinese man and took care of him uh, until April uh, when he passed away and then his family uh, dismissed me from their home. Uh, she also was very vulnerable. Another woman is 65 years old, a rather similar story. So these are not only young women necessarily who are suffering human trafficking. Uh, this is a very disturbing aspect that there are women who are in their 50s and 60s who are also enduring the humiliation of human trafficking in some respect, or forced labor. Uh, then at the end, there are two women in their 20s who fit more the definition or the description, as I described earlier, women who are being caught and sold into the sex trade. One woman has been working in the video chat outlet and uh, completely at the mercy of the people who tricked her. And uh, when she doesn't do what she's asked, it says that she has been beaten or raped on, by a number of individuals. So obviously we considered her evacuation as, a, as uh, an important priority. She's also in the group of six. Uh, another woman in her 20s, was sold to a cabbage farm, or the owner of a cabbage farm uh, near the seashore, and she was given 
roughly about $1,500, $2,000. And then she gave that to her parents, but then uh, she reported that she was not given any uh, repayment for her work 10, 12, 13 hours a day in the farm after that. So um, these, this uh, is simply being recounted as a way of explaining that this is occurring uh, even as we sit here or stand here today, that uh, the, the patterns, the difficulties, the dangers, and the humiliation that many are experiencing, these are not historical references. This includes people who are actually being assisted uh, right, right now. So, This is a couple, a Korean, wonderful, and I, one thing I want to say, because I have mentioned uh, throughout this talk that some of the policies of the People's Republic of China uh, have been tremendously daunting challenges, but I really want to add something. The most critical uh, individuals who have been helping the North Koreans when they cross over from North Korea, either the, again, the Yalu River or the uh, Tumen River, are wonderfully compassionate, concerned Chinese individuals who come in contact with the North Koreans, have sympathy and genuine concern and an outreach. So I, I really wanna balance this picture and make sure that I'm making it absolutely clear that the first line of uh, assistance in, in China are the Chinese, uh, oftentimes the Chinese uh, Christian uh, community, but not always. And uh, I, I just want to make that absolutely clear so that I'm not giving a unfair or unbalanced uh, picture here. But uh, as a matter of fact, this is a Chinese couple and uh, for 20 years, they have been helping uh, North Korean refugees. About two years ago, uh, some North Korean secret uh, agents crossed over and uh, murdered the husband. And uh, uh, to my astonishment, his lovely wife is continuing the assistance of refugees despite her husband uh, perishing in such a uh, shocking way. So that is another testimony, uh, testament to uh, the kind of determination to help in humanitarian assistance. I would like to open up for questions if anyone has them. Uh, it's just my home, near my hometown. The people in my hometown feel, feel, feel very scared at that time. Uh, they feel uh, the people from Korea, uh, North, North uh, DPRK, uh, sorry, sorry, DPRK uh, uh, come to China illegally and they violate Chinese law. They went, uh, so uh, don't you think it is better to solve this problem? Uh, it is better to solve the problem by talking with the leaders of DPRK rather than blaming China's law. Thank you very much. I would really, first of all, thank you for pointing that out, and you're from that area. Uh, obviously, this is a very complex picture that exists. In, I believe you're referring to a situation where a renegade soldier from North Korea crossed over and, and did uh, murder a number of people. So that is part of the complex uh, issue, and obviously when there are uh, when there are cases of criminal activity that are being perpetrated by North Koreans, uh, obviously that needs to be dealt with in a fair and, and uh, dispassionate way. But I must say that the number of the number of cases that you that you described are relatively tiny compared to the, for example, the, the human uh, trafficking and 
all of these uh, all of these other cases that exist. Uh, you say yes, breaking Chinese law, but I think, in all fairness, we have to say that China is a member of the Security Council of the United Nations. As such, isn't it reasonable to expect that, that China would allow the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to operate freely in the Yenbian region in order to freely interview and determine who's refugees and obviously if there are people who are lawbreakers, that they, they should be dealt with accordingly. But the fact that the UNHCR is not allowed to operate there and all North Koreans are labeled as illegal economic migrants uh, is, is problematic from, from, a, from the United Nations or from the uh, human rights standpoint. But I freely admit this is not an, uh, a very uh, simple picture, it is a very complex one, but uh, it's encouraging to hear what the official said, but from the activist committee, uh, I mean experience, we, we are still seeing the repatriation of, of North Koreans. So hopefully a solution can be found, I, and I appreciate your question very much. Okay, uh, we'll go to the mic. So um, I, left this, I left his talk, though, feeling pretty cynical and this feeling of hopelessness on the crisis. Um, this is because I, f I felt as though that protests, economic sanctions, soft power can only do so much, as we have seen. Um, so my question is in two parts. In order to really and directly help the lives of 23 million humans, is there, in your opinion, what are your thoughts on a case for regime change through military intervention? Um, or alternatively, do you feel that the reunification between the North and South, two extremely different governments, is at all plausible? Thank you. Uh, when you talk about regime change and extreme sanctions, the, these are government uh, agencies that you're talking about, and obviously, in, in my opinion, the way forward is trying to assist people who are hoping to be free uh, to find some way to do so, and to do so in the most peaceful manner possible in you know, evacuation, etc. cetera. Um, um, it's, that's a very tough question. I, I certainly, you know, living on the Korean Peninsula, and hearing helicopters going over our apartment, you know, every single day, knowing that they're heading for the 38th parallel, which is only about 30 or 40 miles ahead, uh, I'm certainly not in favor of anything that is going to cause tensions to be ratcheted up higher and higher and higher, obviously. Um, whether to some degree sanctions uh, might be relevant. Obviously, a number of nations, uh, not only the United States, but a number of nations seem to feel that uh, some sanctions uh, are at least causing North Korea to consider its activities in terms of their nuclear and their ballistic missile program. Again, I, I don't deal with those matters. I'm very much if reunification, to go to your second part of your question, uh, naturally I would be thrilled at the idea of reunification, but let's be clear, the South Korean definition of reunification is starkly different from the North Korean definition, as you probably know. North Korean uh, the North Korean definition is, is to, uh, to be reunified under the, the Kim family regime. Uh, that would mean that uh, the denial of human rights would spread to 50 million more people. I, I don't imagine there are a great number of people that would be excited about that. How to go forward, I'm, I'm a great, I, I strongly believe that 
the Koreas were not the ones that caused the division of the peninsula in the first place. So the international community has a responsibility to help solve this problem. Obviously, in my view, reunification is a far more desirable outcome, if at all possible. But I, I do think a relevant question is, reunification how? I mean, with freedoms? Or will those be evaporated? Or, or what? So uh, that's, that's the difficult, uncharted territory that I think we have in front of us. And I think it's above my pay grade to really say. But in the meantime, I am happy at the opportunity to maybe help people one by one who've already decided they want a better life to be able to help them in a peaceful way to find those things happen. Hello, sir. My name is Han Yiming. I come from China, and I'm a junior now. My question is, uh, just a few months ago, the North Korea declared that they eliminated the nuclear weapon labs, nuclear weapon experiments, and it's a signal for the world peace. And also, they carry out the reform and open up policies. And uh, my question is, what do you think the UN can do something new in the new situations in the North Korea to help the refugees? Thank you. Yeah, I think all, everyone, and you uh, have expressed that well, the, the summit between North and South Korea, and then also the summit between North Korea and the United States, uh, it was a hopeful sign. I think everyone was uh, hoping that some, some kind of breakthrough would occur. I'm not sure how closely you're following recent news, but it does seem to s appear as if certain um, ballistic missile projects are going forward and some other rather troubling signs that maybe seem to indicate that the uh, the uh, determination by uh, the North Korean government is perhaps less than sincere. I think it more, more time needs to pass before that is actually uh, determined or not. But as to the, your question, and if I may suggest it, I personally think that if it was possible for the leadership of the People's Republic of China to allow the North Koreans to simply come and, and uh, perhaps refugee camps or something like that where they could be questioned and, you know, and uh, uh, their, their stories filtered and de determined, etc. Uh, in my view, this would be an enormous step forward to actually uh, solving the refugee problem. And uh, I am, yeah, I am hopeful that maybe in, in some cases, uh, some time in the future, that may occur. Or if they can't stay, to allow them to pass through, for example, to Mongolia or et cetera, within a two week period or something like that. But um, it would seem to me that from all my sources of information, the North Korean government is not loosening up its policy about allowing its citizens to leave. Instead, they're going the opposite way. They seem to want to tighten it up. So um, I would hope, I would hope that actually as a responsible member of the Security Council that, that China would uh, see the wisdom of uh, perhaps allowing more of them to stay and uh, seeing what kind of dynamics could play out as a result of that in a peaceful and orderly way. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hannah. I'm from Houston, Texas, USA. So I understand that there's a lot of political issues that surround the DPRK that we can't have answers to now. But it seems like, especially in the United States, we are, because of that issue, it's like we're ignoring the victims that 
this, is, this issue is creating. However, in, in the past, there has been regimes where refugees have been created, where we've taken action. There's been a lot more advocacy. And you're really unique, or it seems to me in the United States, to be an advocate of refugees in North Korea. So, I mean, the images are there. They're staggering. The numbers are jarring. Why is it that we have ignored this vast population of refugees? Why are you unique um, as an advocate for them? Well, um, I want to make sure I understand your question correctly. In other words, I, I would, I guess, I would say that this particularly, this particular refugee crisis is extremely complex because it's not involving just crossing over into one country and then, you know, for example, the way it has been in Thailand for whether it's the Cambodian refugees or Vietnamese or whatever, that, you know, uh, refugee camps set up, the UN is operating in uh, full freedom, etc. This is simply not the case with people leaving North Korea. And so large agencies, migration, refugee agencies, frankly speaking, don't get involved because there is no government approval for their activities. There, there is government approval, for example, for the UNHCR to operate here or to operate in, in, in other countries. But um, in my view, in my experience, what makes this so unique is that it's an extraordinarily complex environment that they're running into, that the North Koreans are leaving. And it, their, their difficulties and challenges are not over when they cross the Tumen or the Yalu River. In some respects, it's only beginning. Uh, so my question is simple. Have you ever seen people in North Korea uh, exploited or persecuted with your eyes? Report of, as I mentioned earlier, the Commission of Inquiry report of 2014, as uh, sponsored by the United Nations, uh, interviewed uh, a large number of the thousands of North Koreans who themselves had made their way to South Korea, some of whom we assisted. And their testimony of their own personal experience in prison camps and uh, uh, family members of those who had been executed, etc., uh, actually, in my view, carry much more weight than my own personal experience of, you know, going inside. <laughs> <laughs>